This is lecture two on campaigns and elections. We left off talking about electoral districts. These legislative districts have uh, geographical boundaries. Boundaries are drawn by the state legislature sometimes or uh, legislative redistricting boards. These districts are drawn every 10 years to reflect population changes. Now the process of redrawing districts and redistributing legislative representatives is known as redistricting. The geographic shape of the district boundaries may change due to several factors. Population shifts and changes as determined by the uh, United States Census. In 1962, a Supreme Court case, Baker v. Carr, was decided and ruled that federal courts could intervene in the drawing of the legislative districts. Later, the court ruled that state legislative and congressional districts must be roughly equal in population. This reflects a principle of one person, one vote. At the time, U.S. House District population was roughly 700,000, although it has changed in subsequent years. If we look at the 2020 census and the reapportionment that occurred, you see population changes. California lost representation, while Texas, Florida, and Arizona gained. Some of the upper Midwest, New York, Pennsylvania, also lost representation. Now, the drawing of legislative districts is essentially a political undertaking. The party that controls the process wants to create a partisan advantage. This is what's known as gerrymandering, a strategy of drawing the legislative districts to favor a particular political party. Now, the term comes from the name of a 19th century Massachusetts governor, Elbridge Gerry. Gerry drew a district in the shape of a salamander, hence the mandering part. But now, politicians for one party strategically manipulate district boundaries to disadvantage the other party. Dispersing voters of one party into two or more districts dilutes that party's power, also known as cracking. Concentrating voters of one party into as few districts as possible is called packing and ensures it cannot win outside of those districts. This results in safe districts where there is little two-party competition. Partisan gerrymandering has recently become increasingly controversial. Politicians from one party intentionally manipulate district boundaries to their advantage of their party. The court has ruled that extreme gerrymandering is unconstitutional, but has not agreed on how to measure or define it. The Supreme Court has generally been opposed to the creation of majority-minority districts. This is a district in which the majority of the constituents belong to a racial or ethnic minority. While the court is opposed, most majority minority districts occur naturally in states or geographical areas with large minority populations. The founders understood that redistricting would require political accountability, which is why they gave that task to state legislatures from the beginning. Legislatures that performed that task poorly or corruptly could be voted out of office. Unelected independent commissioners who draw the districts could not. Gerrymandering goes back centuries and has been used by both parties to establish political and electoral support, passing off critical functions of a representative democracy to unaccountable bureaucrats is neither good government nor good governance, however. This task should be handled by elected officials accountable to the voters. And here's a picture on the left of the original gerrymandered district in Massachusetts. And on the right, you'll see Texas's congressional uh, 35th district and how it stretches from San Antonio up to Austin. And you, you'll see it generally follows the main roads, which is, you know, kind of that's where people have a tendency to live is off the main roads. But it is gerrymandered. 
Let's talk about the presidential nomination process. The first stage in a presidential election is the nomination process. Nominations involve primary elections and caucuses. The caucus is a meeting of voters to choose the party's candidate. The Iowa caucus is first, followed by the New Hampshire primary. In Iowa and New Hampshire, candidates spend a lot of time on retail politics. In other words, meeting voters face to face. The results from each state's primary or caucus determine how its delegates or representatives will vote in their party's national convention. Like general elections, early primaries and caucuses have high levels of national media coverage. They have a lot of campaign ads and intensive voter mobilization drives. Iowa and New Hampshire disproportionate role in picking presidential candidates is due to their being first states to cast votes. The presidential nomination process today has become what is termed front-loaded. This refers to when the states vie to increase their political influence by holding their primaries or caucuses earlier in the year. Early voting states are important because they help candidates secure national media attention, contributions, and higher ratings in public opinion polls. A candidate who fares poorly in these early voting states may be written off by the media as a loser and eventually drop out of the race. Now we move towards the party conventions. In the nation's first 50 years, presidential nominations were controlled by congressional caucuses. They were named the King Caucus. Party conventions ultimately replaced these. State party leaders picked delegates from the 1830s to up until World War II. The primaries and caucuses now select the delegates. The delegates draft the party platform, a statement of party philosophy, principles, and policy positions. So in other words, the National Party Convention's three most important activities will be to nominate the president and the vice presidential candidates, draft their party platform, and approve changes that will govern the party until the next party convention. Now, how do we elect the president? This is done through the Electoral College. Voters do not directly vote for the president. Instead, voters elect electors who represent their state in the Electoral College. Electors in the Electoral College select the president and vice president. The state party typically chooses the electors, and the number of electors for each state equals the size of its congressional delegation, both House members plus two senators. Electoral votes are won on a state-by-state -state basis. There are 538 electors in all. The winning candidate needs a majority, 270 votes, to become president. The president of the United States is the winner of the Electoral College, but not necessarily the candidate with the most popular votes. This is in part because the Electoral College in most elections in the United States are governed by plurality, winner-take-all rules. With only two exceptions, each state awards all of its electors to the candidate who receives the most votes in that state. This fact makes it mathematically possible for a candidate who receives the most popular votes nationwide to fail to carry enough states for their electoral votes to add up in a majority. There has been an attempt, named the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, to reform this system. This compact will award the state's electoral college votes to the candidate who wins the popular election. Um, whether or not the uh, compact will actually be realized anytime soon is up for grabs. I don't know. We're going to end uh, this lecture here.